Good afternoon, guys. Happy Wednesday, as always. Hopefully, you guys are all doing wonderful and amazing today. Hopefully, lots of good things are happening. Uh, today's live stream kind of wanted to talk about carbon dosing. Um, I've actually had a couple of people ask me about this lately, and somebody kind of re special requested this one. So I figured, sure, I haven't talked about carbon dosing in a while. So a couple kind of things got started. Um, first of all, why would someone want to carbon dose? So carbon dosing is mainly a form of reducing nutrients. And what's going on, Raven? What's going on, Dave? Duradicate. Welcome, guys. So carbon dosing is mainly used to get rid of nitrates. Now, there's always the easier ways of doing it, like using a refugium or different methods like that. If you don't have a refugium, you don't have space for it, maybe that's one of the reasons you want to do carbon dosing, or maybe you have these and it isn't big enough and it just can't quite help get rid of those nitrates. What's going on, Javier? So carbon dosing is kind of almost like a back chemical slash bacterial way of removing nitrates. So you can get rid of phosphates. You have GFO is probably the most common way, or there's lanthium chloride, which is more of a chemically way of doing it. What's going on, DC? Uh, what's going on, Tyreef? So there's a couple different ways. So when you do carbon dosing, it actually does get rid of nitrates and phosphates, but the ratio is about 16 to 1. So it's 16 nitrates to 1 phosphate. Now to kind of fully understand how carbon dosing works, you kind of got to know the basics of the nitrogen cycle. So... As you know, you got your fish, they poop, it makes ammonia, which turns into nitrite. And then after nitrite, it turns into nitrate. Now, ammonia is toxic, nitrite's slightly less toxic, and nitrate's less toxic out of three. Too much nitrate is obviously a bad thing. Um, now, you never want 100%, you don't want zero of anything, right? So you never want zero nitrates. Um, what's going on, DJ's Reef? So you're saying, what about Zeovit? Zeovit is also another way of doing it. I have never personally done Zeovit. But if someone wants to hop on later that has, then might be kind of a good way to dig into it. Um, I have done vodka dosing. It's the one that I've tried in the past. So you can get rid of your nitrates through a giant refugium. You can do it. You know, you got your Chato, your Ketomorpha are the kind of the obvious ones that most people do. You got your carbon reactors, you got algae turf scrubbers. All these are going to remove those. But for if you don't have the space for it or you need to do something in a more compact form, that's where some people will start to resort or look down carbon dosing. Reef Keeper, welcome. Mark, welcome, guys. So, okay. So we kind of went over the whole cycle. So we got our fish poop, ammonia, nitrite, to nitrate. Um, next in carbon dosing, uh, one thing you guys might have heard of is called the Redfield Ratio. And I believe it's 106 or 116 to 16 to 1. And that was revamped to 117 to 14 to 1. And that's the ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus. So one thing some people don't realize, if you're using something like GFO and trying to do carbon dosing, if you don't have any phosphates, this isn't going to work. You need that ratio. So you need at least, you know, your one ppm of phosphates in order for your carbon dosing to remove that 16 ppm of, ppm of nitrates. So it's one thing that you kind of got to take into consideration is some of these methods may clash and not 100% work nicely together. Uh, Reef Keeper, hello, hello. Carbon dose my old tank, vodka hooked up, and the dosing pumps works great. Excellent, always good to hear. Uh, so Mark was saying, love carbon dosing, went vodka to vinegar to bile pellets. I found I was a lot happier with the vodka than I was pouring pouring the vodka into my tank. Um, okay, so on that, there's two different ways. Bio pellets, I've never used. I've Honestly, I've, I've avoided them a little bit just because... If you ever have a power outage and there's bio pellets in a reactor for an extended period, that water in there can get really funky. And if your power's out for an extended period of time and it gets put back in your tank, that can cause some damage. So if you ever do have a power outage you're using bio pellets, make sure you dump out all the water in that reactor before you turn the power and bring that back online. So a bit of a warning. Now, when you have something like bio pellets in a reactor, it's essentially, I don't know if it's like a corn or a sugar or whatever it is in there but basically the bacteria will slowly break that down those bio pellets are your carbon source and then as those kind of get eat up and dissolved it's releasing that into the water so you're kind of doing it that way to do it now you're adding a lot at first and it slowly dwindles down to nothing where if you do it with a liquid form like a like no pox or vodka or vinegar one of these then it's kind of the other way around you want to start super small and slowly up your dosage 
Now there is a couple, if you just Google vodka dosing or vinegar dosing, you're going to see these little charts pop up and it kind of gives you your size of tank and how to, how much to dose. So if you are doing it, something you want to start off very, very small amounts and, you know, maybe every week you go up like half a mil or a mil, like you really want to ease yourself into it because too much too fast can definitely cause some damage. Now, how this kind of works is for, so with the red field ratio, um, the carbon source which we're adding to our tank is, you know, the carbons, the sugars, the vodka. That's acting as a carbon source. What's going on, Nick? Hey, Lisa. Hey, Dev. I'm here in your stream. Excellent. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So I'm running late. Uh, no problem. Uh, reefing in college. You guys ever watch the Reef Filters interview with Red Sea? They say all these carbon methods introduce a lot of unknowns and bad. I actually watched that today. So, yes, I have. Um, so that was actually a pretty good little interview with them. So one of the main kind of scientist guys for Red Sea, there's was a good video with Jake from Reef Builders, and he kind of went into why they developed Nopox, and it is a form of carbon dosing like vinegar or vodka and those different ones, but they more fine tuned it to try and make sure stuff sticks to that Redfield ratio, and you're not introducing necessarily introducing a bunch of other bad stuff that could potentially build up over time, which you may be doing with you know your vinegars and your vodkas, your sugars and other different nutrients. Now, one thing I did to note, um, I've only personally ever used vinegar. It's the only one I've actually tried. Or sorry, vodka. I haven't used vinegar. Um, some people have reported more likely to have cyanol when using vodka. Um, I didn't have any personal experience with cyanol at the time. There is supposedly the ethanol-based ones are a little more prone to cyanol than the ethanol ones. Yeah, ethanol is more prone to the cyanol than the whatever the other one is, vinegar. The more acidic versions. Uh, do do now. Another good thing is if you are doing carbon dosing, you definitely want to have a good skimmer because your skimmer is what's going to help kind of bind those that bacteria that's kind of bound those nutrients and bring them out of your water column. That's kind of your way of exporting it. So you definitely, if you are doing carbon dosing, you need to have a decent skimmer. Make sure it's working well. Um, interested in trying no pox in your future? I have I have some of it. I haven't used it yet. My nitrates haven't really been high enough to justify using it but yeah i definitely have heard good things it's more of a slower gentler approach at it which is a good thing but yeah, everyone i've talked to that uses it says good results with it um, now the whole point of reducing your nitrates is that you know you can feed more to your tank you can feed your corals more your fish more you know in turn they're going to be happier um there's going to be less toxic stuff building up in your water over time so i mean you can 100 percent do this with refugium and other natural algae absorption ways as well right so just a couple of different ways to look at it. The whole carbon dosing is really just a different kind of tool in your arsenal to go about it. Uh, Nick, have you, do you do carbon dosing at all in your tanks? I know, I know your, your little tang in a shot glass potentially has carbon. In there, but... <laughs> um, yeah, I've done various methods. I've used um, sugar, used vodka. Um, actually, I'm a little bit dissimilar to yourself because I actually like the bio pellets and the marine pills okay. and the way that they work. But I do take on more the point you were making that, you know, if you have a power outage, you've just got those, you know, kind of fermenting away. So, yeah, I do appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. I just find it's very easy to tune with the pellets. Yeah. Um, I remember on one of the streams, I think uh, it was Michael was talking about uh, the use or, or no need to be using pellets on a new system mm -hmm. because there's no nitrates to reduce as the tank cycling. Yeah. Um, but my opinion on that is actually using the, you can actually use the pellets to cultivate bacteria for a cycle to help it mm -hmm. to, to breed the bacteria that you need. So it, you can use them in that way as well. So, you know, for people not to just think that, it's a nitrate reduction tool. It's actually a very good way to boost bacteria levels in your system as well if you okay. do it properly. Just just on that note with um, kind of the different levels, hey Al, um, so if you, okay, so with the red field ratio, basically what that kind of means. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not. Yeah, no, it does. It um, So in order to, for those planktons and those bacteria to absorb that, they need to have carbon, they need to have phosphorus, so they need to have nitrogen. So if any one of those are missing or limited, so if you don't have that 106, 116, whatever it is, carbon molecules to your 16 
nitrogen to your one phosphorus, like it's not going to absorb, it's not going to feed that culture. So by adding a carbon source, which Nick was just saying through like, uh, still hear me? Not at the moment. Uh, <laughs> so by if your tank's limited in like say a carbon source, then you're not necessarily going to get the effectiveness of it growing the bacteria culture, which is going to be reducing and absorbing those nitrates. And I know you just asked if you could hear me. That may have been from a minute ago, though. I do see you're muted, though. Now, there is other things I've seen for removing nitrates. I've never used it, but um, there's like sulfur, sulfur denitrators, I think they're called. They're big, giant things. They're more used in more of an industrial level in public aquariums, like large scale, uh, large scale stuff. I have a buddy that has one. I don't think he's ever hooked it up. But so just kind of another method of doing it. I think it uses like a sulfur or something in there to absorb them somehow. Um, so a couple different things, uh, vodka versus vinegar It's generally about one mil of vodka to seven mils of vinegar as kind of the scale. Sometimes you look at a chart and they'll tell you one or the other. So if you're looking at one for vodka, you want to vinegar just times by seven or vice versa for the other way. Uh, let me just lost my chat window. Uh, so Mark, 100% correct. Get nitrates under control before attacking phosphates, like anything in this hobby. Slow and steady. Yeah, I definitely want to go slow. I learned my lesson once in the past where I, when I was doing vodka dosing, I raised it too fast. And the one main thing I noticed, I don't know how it affected it, but on my yellow tang, he had some weird little orange blotch type of stuff that started to develop on him. I cut back on it and a couple weeks later went away. So it was somehow linked to carbon dosing, but that was for me raising it faster than I should have. So definitely a lesson learned there. Hey, what's going on, Jeff from Daily Reefing? If anyone does want to join the chat, I am actually doing it through Discord today. So if any of you guys are in my Discord group, that's where it is if you want to join. Sorry, Dev, I'm here again. My headset cut off. <laughs> no problem. So it's technical. <laughs> Did you get everything that I said? No, I heard nothing in the last like five minutes. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Did you hear me about uh, using the bio pellets to help cycle the system as well as to, to reduce nitrates? Not to cycle. So tell us again. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was on a stream a while back. And I think it was Mike was sort of saying about, um, so I was asking about using bio pellets on a new system. And it was kind of like, well, why would you need to use it? Because it's a lower nitrate, so you're not going to have any nitrates in a new system when you're cycling it, right? Because mm -hmm. you can have ammonia to nitrate to nitrate and so on. But actually, you can use the uh, bio pellets to help cycle a tank because you're helping to cultivate that bacteria that you need mm -hmm. to boost the levels of the thing. So in that respect, you, you know, if you think about it, you can use it you know, that way as well as uh, nitrate reduction. Hmm, good to know. David actually had a good point. So adding vinegar to super saturate calquasers on turn, they are carbon dosing to a point. Yeah, you would be. Mm. Yeah. Didn't even consider exactly. that, but good point. Um, Al was asking, do bio pellets house the bacteria or is it a food source? It's a food source as it breaks down. Uh, it kind of does both, to be fair. What generally happens mm -hmm. is that the bacteria will form onto the pearl or the pellet itself. And that's why uh, you want to fluidize the pellets because... Um, the young fresh bacteria will cling on and hold on and feed on the carbon. Mm -hmm. Whereas okay. where, as the bacteria starts to get a bit older, the movement of the uh, tumbling of the pellets will dislodge the older bacteria that's less efficient mm -hmm. and that'll drop off. Uh, and then you obviously you want the skimmer to take that out and then that'll leave space for new bacteria to form. So yeah, it kind of does host the, the pellets as well. Let's yep. feed on them. Mm -hmm. That was good. So, yeah, so it is a food source, but once they start to break it down, then they live on the surface of the pellet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it, yeah. so I guess kind of both. Um, would do you say bio pellets or carbon dosing are most effective? Technically, they're both different forms of carbon dosing, right? So, mm -hmm. a bio pellet is basically a little ball, which is a carbon source. And as it breaks down, you're feeding the bacteria. If you do like vodka or no pox or sugars or any of those, same thing. It's just providing, they're just different forms of carbon that you're adding to the tank. So they're all carbon dosing. They're just different methods of it. The one thing I would say though, uh, the, the, the whole reason I've always avoided bio pellets to an extent, like Nick, you like them. You like them. I've never tried them, but. Yeah. Um, the only thing with the pills and the pellets though is it's like with anything, check, check mm -hmm. each brand out or the one, that, the particular ones that you're looking at. Yep. Um, 
because some some of the pills and pellets contain binders and other things to in the formation uh, mm -hmm. formulation of them. The ones I particularly like, so a bit of brand dropping if you like, is the Dr. Tim's one. Yep. Uh, the reason for that is the very natural um, carbon source, very organic carbon source, and they don't have the the binders and stuff in them that the other pills and pellets can have. Mm -hmm. um, so some people have noticed that with particular um, pills and pellets, they've got a lot of affluent, you know, really kind of gungy affluent uh, being issued, and that's those binders being released as the, the pellets break down. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the Dr. Tim's one is a, a particular favorite of mine that's worth checking out. Nice, not as excellent. Yeah, the, the big caution I always give people, if you are going to do the carbon dosing or through bio pellets, if you have a controller, I'd make sure the kind of the fallback option is always set to off. That way, if you have a power outage or something happens, it's going to stay off until you turn it back on just because it can kind of ferment and funky stuff can be back in there. And if it's off for a day or two and it also dumps it all back in your tank, I have heard of some kind of disaster stories coming out of that. So that's my, yeah, that's my I mean, only kind of hesitation with bio pellets. It's kind of a pre-warning. Just make sure... It, there's some way of yeah. you not turning it back on or you unplug it if your power is out for a while and dump it out, add fresh water. In. Yeah, I'd say the same. I think it's with any reactor, though. If you, you know, any kind of reactor, if it's a sediment type reactor, that if you haven't got flow running through it, yeah, be really careful of what it's containing at that point. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've seen people leave all kinds of stuff just fermenting, and then, like you said, they're switching back yeah. on, and it's like, no. <laughs> so yeah, to that to that yeah, point, that's that's, that's probably true for most of your reactors. Actually, if you had, you know, mm. for a couple hours, I wouldn't worry. But if you had a couple day power outage, I'd almost want to dump out any of that kind of stagnant water that was sitting in there for extended periods, not being circulated, and any type of reactor, because who knows what kind of funky stuff's happening after a while. Have you gone through like dosing levels and stuff like that? Devon, what happens if you overdose and stuff, the kind of symptoms that you can get, like the stringy, the white stringy mm. bacterial blooms and Great cloudy point. water. Great point. Lower oxygen and all that kind yep. of stuff. Okay. So the bacteria also will, like to next point, use up more of the oxygen in the water. So one benefit of having a protein skimmer or doing bubbling, any of those types of methods is you're adding extra oxygen and air into the water so you're help feeding it so the bacteria doesn't suck all that oxygen up and kind of starve other stuff in your tank. Now, if you are dosing too much or when you first start, a lot of people will get a bacteria bloom in the tank and it's almost like a white, whitish, milkyish kind of film you'll see on some your rock in certain places of your tank. That's a bacteria boom, bloom. And that can happen when you first start, if it's chalking it too much, or more than likely if you're raising it or you're overdosing it, so you're adding too much too quick. Um, is there any other kind of things that you've experienced or seen, Nick, from overdosing it? Uh, yeah, just the stringy bacteria. You can get films on rock work and stuff like that mm -hmm. as well. Um, I d to be honest, I haven't researched much on the the particular like filming bacteria that, that that's developed to be honest mm -hmm. uh but it's a good indication that you you're probably overdoing it okay. um for sure i mean i know we, you were saying earlier Dev, about talking about um carbon dosing and then maybe going on to other methods of nitrate re reduction mm -hmm. without having to use carbon dosing but yeah. the, there's a face there's actually a really good facebook group i can't remember um what it's called or who the guys are there but i remember dropping in on them for a while and if you actually research and get in with a group of people that you know are carbon dose fanatics if you like yeah they're, they're actually really good because uh, one of the things i didn't know until i went into that group was that there's actually different levels of carbon dosing so you they, they carbon dose for nitrate re reduction mm -hmm. the carbon dose then for stabilization and then they even uh, do a type of carbon dosing that is, um, is something to do with the metabolism of the corals to help it um, <laughs> with the nutrition so interesting generally yeah generally when we people talk about carbon dosing it's usually because they're trying to reduce nitrate yeah um, but if, if I'll try and find out what that Facebook group's called now, but um, on there, they were discussing different levels of carbon dosing for different reasons, and that was really interesting. So, yeah, it's definitely a subject to, uh, to delve into a little bit deeper, I think. 
Yeah, send me a link, actually, if you do find that. I'd be curious to find out. Yeah, I'll, look. I'll have a look for it. But yeah, m- removing, you know, mainly nitrogen and a little bit of phosphates is kind of the, the main reasons that always pop up, or at least the ones that I've experienced with it. Now, one thing to note, if you are dosing one of the liquid forms, there will be a point when you watch your nitrates, and it's going to drop to zero or almost zero. At that point, in general, you want to cut your dosage in half and kind of keep it there as more of a maintenance dose and just kind of monitor and go from there. Um, you never, as with like pretty much all parameters, you never want it to be zero. I know I've seen other systems too where they actually, they're, they're literally trying to update their, increase our nitrates on a frequent basis, right? If you have zero, usually you're starving your curls or something. Mm-hmm. I I keep mine more around the 15 inch range. I think you get a bit better coloration in your corals. If it's too low, I think you lose a bit of the color. So I kind of keep mine 15 to 20 ish is kind of my happy range that I shoot for. Yeah, I think um, I remember speaking to Paul uh, Williams when we were, we were working on his tank, and mm-hmm. it was weird because the first stage I said we need to purge your water. So we purged the, the nitrates and stuff out of that. Then we said, we're going to raise the nitrates now. And he was like, we're going to do what? <laughs> and I said, well, we're gonna, well, the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to purge your rock. So we, you know, use mm-hmm. bacteria and bubbling and all that good stuff. We purged his rock. So obviously the nitrates was leaching out the rock and into yeah. the water. So the nitrates went up. <laughs> then we purged the water again. Mm-hmm. And then I said to him, okay, now we're going to raise your nitrates again. And he's like, going to do what? <laughs> we just got rid of it. And I said, well, yeah, but the reason we would, the nitrates going to go up because then we were going to start nutritionalizing the coral and the byproduct of that is again nitrate but because the coral is getting a lot of nutrition and good stuff it overrules the slight increase in the nitrate so mm-hmm. if your nitrate is coming from like good a good source like nutrition and things like that that the corals is directly benefiting from for me it's a slightly different thing to it coming from decomposition of waste matter Mm -hmm. in the rock and leaching into water, for example. So I would say when you look at nitrate levels and you say, I like to keep mine between sort of like five and 15, um, but you've got to kind of understand where the source of that nitrate, Mm -hmm. if it's from decomposition, is that useful to coral? Yeah. If it's from nutrition that you nutritionalize your coral, then yeah, that's going to be useful for your coral. So don't just base it on the nitrate level itself. Understand why that nitrate level is there. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's that's what I would say. Is it coming from decomposition or is it coming from nutrition? Mm. No, that's um, a good point. That, that makes one. sense. <laughs> uh, mine, at least, I feel is from. I, I feed quite a bit in my tank, fairly heavy, so. That's, probably where most of it comes from what are you feeding no what are you feeding the tank? Uh, i feed nori in the mornings and a nice healthy dosing of frozen food at night Once what are you feeding your coral frozen food <laughs> frozen food i'll <laughs> once, tell you what once um, in a while i feed other stuff but 90 percent of the time it's just the mysis and all that stuff the small particles i just broadcast feed everywhere do you use um acro power at all for your uh, amino acids and sometimes stuff for two little fishes i used right. to have that on a doser i'll probably go back to it eventually um have you, you have you used um the two little fishes goni power before no just aqua power oh there you go holy grail right there really you want to get grab a tub of that it's like a powdered form goni uh, power? Mix it in the, you can mix goni power all right I'll so it mix up. it in with your other foods that you feed or just you know do a little bit of the feed with that but yeah really nice food the goni power mm-hmm. so yeah very nutrition very good so yeah you might want to try that one out okay yeah, i will look into that i do have um what's the other one the polyp lab one and a few other ones refroids and a few others right. i always refroids. forget about it to be honest yeah. every once in a while it's probably like once every month in a bit i'll actually remember to use it but 90 percent of the time it's literally just you know a lot of people rinse the frozen food i never rinse i just leave all those yeah. little bits of particles <laughs> and stuff in there and i use that to feed the corals yeah, I mean, rinsing your food, you're going to... See, for me, it's like the preservatives that they put in that, the idea of rinsing it is you're going to get rid of the excess that's in the frozen water, right? But mm-hmm. the whole point of preservatives is that it soaks into the food and preserves it. Mm-hmm. So I can't really see a big benefit to rinsing the food, really, because a lot of that preservatives is going to be in the food already. I'm a big fan of making your own fresh, yep. to be honest, because yeah. then you're in full control. No, exactly. 
Um, so question in the comments from a minute ago before it scrolls away. So TMG was asking about carbon dosing during a cycle to supercharge it, and which you kind of commented on to a certain extent to help feed that bacteria from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Mark was also commenting, as TMG mentioned, using bio pellet reactor to promote growth of population of healthy bacteria. I do not believe mm -hmm. dosing, vodka dosing does the same thing as bio pellets. It also home mm -hmm. versus a food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different. Uh, it's, it's the way the um, carbon is basically in the products. You want, for me, I like a really good organic carbon. Um, so I, that's one of the. That's another reason I prefer the pellets personally. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, did you talk about the different types of bacteria and how they like some some of the bacteria will dislodge the the nitrogen molecule, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, from the nitrate, but um, oh, I can never remember which bacteria is. I call it the H bacteria because it begins with H. Yeah. <laughs> but it's particular uh, that will absorb the nitrate into its membrane. Yeah. So you can get those forming. So that's another reason why, uh, for me, I always run the skimmer with the, the pellets because if I'm forming that particular bacteria strain, mm -hmm. if they just float off into your system and perish, they're just going to release nitrate back into your water. Great point. Uh, um, output of a biopel reactor should be right in front of your skimmer intake. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding me of that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that way you're going to suck up any affluent from any binders that are mm -hmm. leaching out. And then also the, the dead dying bacteria that gets released as well. Mm -hmm. oh, great points. Rossi's Reef Tank was asking, what about sugar dosing? I've never tried it. You did mention that you have done sugar dosing in the past. Did you find much yeah, of a difference in sugar versus vodka versus bio pellets? People generally like vodka because it's slightly more controllable than the sugar. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, sugar's quite potent, so you have to be quite you know careful with it uh, and the, the way it breaks down and stuff like that. But I'll be honest, since, I'm going to sound like a record player in a minute, but I'll be honest, since the the bypass and, and the pills came out mm. that for me it's just so it's so controllable because it, you're not having to keep dosing 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 you just put the amount in and and let it break down um and i would always say if anything have a good maintenance regime of, you know um and everything else so that the the, the pellets or the vodka or whatever you're using isn't you know, the system isn't reliant on that alone. Okay, so you know, if it's a part of a puzzle, you know, if it's a part of things mm -hmm. that you've got, you know, multiple things in place, yep. you can have a better, stronger structure to your system so rather I have, than okay. reliant on that one thing. I have a question just on one, the way you said. So you said mm -hmm. that you think bio pellets are more controllable. So mm -hmm. in, in my thoughts, at least on the subject, is that, dosing a liquid form is more controllable because you can tweak exactly how much you're dosing in where biopolis you just put a bunch in a reactor and wait till it breaks down then i mean you add some more and top it off every once in a while so to me that would seem less controllable you're kind of just uh, add it and it slowly yeah. dissolves away no because you think about a reactor the great thing about reactors is one you can control the amount of media that you put in the reactor so that's you know straight away you've got controllability yeah. there uh, the second thing is you can control the flow, which is really important for bacteria. So if you have like high flow going through, you're going to get sort of like aerobic bacteria uh, and less anaerobic bacteria forming. If you steady the flow really like slow, slow it back down, um, you can actually calibrate. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you can actually calibrate your reactor. So you can measure the nitrate, you know, going in and the nitrate coming out of it. Um, yeah. So... You can actually uh, tune your reactor uh, and and do it in two ways: one by the amount of the media, and two by the flow rate going through it. Yeah, no, that's so fair. that's what I mean okay. by controllability. Then that then if your stock is staying the same and it's a maturing system, then once you've tuned it and calibrated it, you can kind of think at this flow rate, I'm getting this effect to my system this way. And with this amount of pills or pellets, it's mm -hmm. affecting it this way. So you can basically calibrate the flow and a combination of how much media you've got to kind of say, well, 
you know, if my nitrates are at this level, this is how much I put in and this is the flow rate I put through. And I know that's going to lower my nitrates over a period of maybe a week or a few days to a week by this much. Mm -hmm. So you've got that direct, you know, it's going to okay. directly do that in a sense. All right. So it's, it's tunable. Okay, that's it's, it's like tunable that. to an extent. Okay, mm -hmm. no, that's tunable. a good description. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. No uh, problem. <laughs> I've never personally used bio pellets, so this is where you're, you're more definitely more of an expert on that one than I am. Yeah, I just find it a lot, a lot more flexible in that way. Mm -hmm. Where with vodka dosing and sugar dosing, you kind of have to do it, you know. And it's like remembering to do it. Like I, I'm a lazy reefer, that's, you know, so I hate doing <laughs> stuff every day. That's, you know, that's where a doser comes, comes in. Four or five days. Yeah, it's like the, it's doing things regulated, you know, and I. I kind of, there's certain things, yeah, you have to do regulated, but there's certain things like, why do you want to do so many things that are regulated? You're just going to not be able to enjoy your tank. You're just going to be a slave to your system. I, I would never so, dose that by hand. I'd 100% be on a doser where I just, like, every week, you're mm, like, ah, at half a mil. And it's yeah, and then you get, like, mechanical issues. You get blockages. You get this, you get that. And I, I just think, uh, you know, the biopellet reactors work generally seamlessly. Uh, if you have a power outage, you're going to know about that, right? Yeah. So, you know, but yeah, generally you just leave it in the background and top it up every once in a while and it's just doing its thing. So it's a bit like using a calcium reactor, really. So on a biopellet reactor, do you add a bunch of biopellets at once or do you only add a little bit and slowly add more? How do you work that? Uh, in any given, because this is where, um, you know, there's certain phrases in the hobby that I just hate, you know, where people say nothing good happens in a reef fast. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know where that saying comes from because some really good stuff happens really quickly in a reef tank. Um, but the, the sense of like everybody's tank's different, mm -hmm. I think with chemistry and, and flow and things like that, because it is governed by stock levels, um, how efficient your skimmer is, how efficient your flow is, your, you know, your aquascape, is it trapping, is it an open scape? So all of these factors do come to play. Mm -hmm. with the nitrate you know with your chemistry and nitrate build up and so on um so what i would generally advise is is like i said you know learn to calibrate your your reactor you're using the pearls so mm -hmm. start off at a low level and then slowly build it and monitor and record and then you should be able to then kind of start to see when it kicks in mm -hmm. and by how much and then try adding you know if it's coming down by point zero one or you know point one then see what happens with a little bit extra and then if it starts coming down every sort of three four days by one then that you can then start to tune and calibrate and understand you know where where the calibration is on how much you use in the flow rate and what effect it's going to have on your system mm -hmm. so i would you know in um big public aquarium stuff you know they weigh their food and they split their food down into so many kilograms of protein and so many kilograms of this and that yeah. because in a big public aquarium, their filtration system, they don't ever want to overpower it. It's mm. got to be working at very like peak efficiency for the, for the water power, especially if they're keeping things like sharks and rays and stuff, very sensitive fish. So what they'll do is they'll weigh all the food to calibrate understanding on what load, that puts onto the filtration system mm -hmm. so it's a really good thing you know for hobbyists to do that is to calibrate what they're doing you know so that they know what effect it's going to have on the system mm -hmm. um you'll know from yourself like with your corals sometimes you'll get really good basing out sometimes you'll get really good branch growth yep. and then you'll get intense coloration and that fluctuates right mm -hmm. then what you can do is you can actually tune to the coral because uh, you'll notice sometimes it'll seem like your uptake stalls, right? It, you won't get massive sort of skeletal growth so that, you know, all of a sudden your, your DKH starts going up a little bit, your magnesium calcium fluctuates a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and then suddenly your corals will kick in again, and then everything starts getting used again. So if you can calibrate um, what you're putting in to, to readdress and rebalance everything, it, it means you you're much more in control of your system mm -hmm. because you can you can take your your water your water tests or I call them water checks you can take yeah. those and then because you've calibrated out you know you know what you do with everything you can then 
give it exactly what it needs rather than put something in and then be water testing to see what the results are. I, th I think it takes quite a while though to get to that stage where you're does, quote unquote calibrating it. I mean, mo most, yeah. most hobbyists are relying on test kits to know if they're within the but range. That's why, but that's why I call it a check rather than a test. Because yeah. for me, if you do the lick the finger and stick it in the air method, you know, that's North what I West see. If, if you're, you know, if you do a water test and mm -hmm. you're surprised that your nitrates are coming back at 50, then you're not in control of your system. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be able to almost predetermine what your water test is going to be by your actions. Yeah. So if you, so if you do apply a certain thing um, to your system, you do that knowing what effect it's going to have on your system. So then when you do your water test, you're checking that the outcome is as you've, you know, foreseen it to be because of what you've done to your system. Mm -hmm. And that means you're in control of your system then. And that's why it's important. I think it's important to um, calibrate, to understand if I have this many fish in my system and I feed this much, that's going to affect <clears throat> my system in this way. So then I need to have this much GFO. I need to use it this mm -hmm. amount of times a week. I have this much of a water change to do. I have this many bio pellets to do because it's all interlinked. So for me, yeah, if you think of it as the the goal is to calibrate um rather than just test and see what the results tell you and then act on the results you're a reactive reefer rather than a proactive reefer mm -hmm. do you see where i'm coming from with that i know it's a little bit like my sound a bit advanced but it, it if if you can learn to reef that way i feel you're much you're a much safer reefer because it's under control all the time mm -hmm. No, it's, it's very true. And, and over time, I think a lot of people get to that point where you can look at your tank and see something's not happy. And then, you know, you you might have your suspicions. You're testing to figure out exactly why. Mm. Right? I mean, for the most part, as long as if you have your dosers, you have all your stuff automated, it, it should be pretty stable. I and mean, when you do your test, like you mentioned, to check and verify that it is where you think it should be. And if it isn't, then, you know, you need to tweak something slightly. And th that goes for, you know, whether it's your carbon dosing, your L calcium, all that type of stuff. So it is kind of yeah, across I mean, the board. It's like, um, it's like, say, you're using Triton method, for example, and you're dosing a multitude of um, trace elements and things like that. So mm -hmm. in there, there's probably going to be zinc. And then you might be adding, you know, some amino acids. And in there, there might be zinc. And mm -hmm. then in your food, they put zinc in because it helps the fish metabolism, right? Mm -hmm. So then all of a sudden, Nope, so then when you do when you get your icp test back all of a sudden you've got a high zinc reading and then you're going oh where did that come from mm -hmm. this is what i mean so if you can analyze what you're doing and what you know read bottles and see what ingredients what what the ingredients are you kind of go oh hang on a minute this has got zinc that's got zinc that's got zinc that's got zinc <laughs> Ooh, i'm going to be adding a lot of zinc into my system yep so then when you get you do your test and it's a high zinc level you kind of go, well, that's why, because I was adding a lot of zinc. Yeah. Um, so Lisa was just quickly asking, so if it's a new system and I were to dose, would it cause the bacteria bloom? Now, assume you're talking about a carbon source. If you dose too much too fast, yes, it most definitely will. If you just do a tiny bit and slowly work it up, I mean, you might get a small one. Yeah, that's the way I would do it is mm -hmm. slowly mm -hmm. and start to see at what point it makes a difference. Yep. I mean, the thing is, with with with, uh, it, it's like um, there's a bit of time lapse as well. So, you know, when you put it in, don't expect to see an instant change because you're talking bacteria. So, mm -hmm. if you're talking about, um, you know, when you cycle a tank for the first time, uh, and if you do it, what called a natural cycle, where you don't add, you know, lots of bacteria and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you'll probably develop bacteria over a period of six to eight weeks. Yep. to the point where it starts completing the nitrate cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you think that you're boosting bacteria, it's still going to take a bit of time. It won't, once you've got an established system, it's not going to take sort of six to eight weeks. It will happen a lot quicker than that. But you're still, mm -hmm. it's still a delayed result, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's, you've got to be really careful not to overshoot. It's, I always describe it like um, 
the parameters it's and when you try and change reduce or increase parameters it's a little bit like a locomotive train hmm. um it won't stop on a dime it might take three miles for that train to come to a stop you know from full speed to a stop uh the whoever's driving the chain the train as it comes in the station probably starts to slow down like a mile or so before the station because of the momentum mm -hmm. um and it's the same with when you're just in parameters if you keep adding and adding and, and then you're watching your test results and you go okay when it gets to this point i'll stop adding yeah what you probably see is that you overshoot and it'll keep keep you know going up and up and up because you've you've only stopped when you've got to that point rather than before and let it gradually grind to a halt at mm -hmm. the point you want it. So that's where you've got to be careful, I think, with with carbon dosing. Is understand that it's a delayed, it's a delayed result, it's a delayed reaction, and you've got to anticipate that. Yep. So as with everything, I mean, very very slow. At least with carbon, with vodka, you know, it's you you do it at first off like you know it could be a mil half a mil you wait a week or two then you go up like half a mil or one mil like you do it very slowly and work your way up <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and that's why like you know i know it sounds a bit geek, reef geeky but that's why i like calibrating because you can basically say right i know from experience of my calibrating that if i do this this is the result mm -hmm. if i have this much sugar for five days over a 10-day period this is the result I'm going to get. Yep. I was laughing. You see what I mean? Yeah. I was laughing at Dano Nano's comment or the blind faith method, Zeovit or Aquafor. <laughs> yeah. So, well, <laughs> Zeovit, you have yeah. your rocks and your reactor, you break up. It's kind of, if you think of a bio pellet reactor, you have your bio pellets that constantly tumble. You're, you're the one that's shaking those rocks and knock that bacteria off. It's still growing on the rocks. It's, it's a similar concept. Mm -hmm. It's a, the, all these different methods are just different methods or sources of carbon but they're still for the most part going towards the same similar goal hmm. um aqua forest i have not used that one so i can't really speak too much on that one but i mean the, the problem that we've got in the aquariums is that carbon isn't in abundance mm -hmm. but usually nitrate and phosphate is because we're adding that right yeah so that's why it, it's difficult because <sighs> With certain things, I think in a reef tank, you try to instill as much nature as you can and let mm -hmm. mother nature because she's really powerful. So she'll do a lot of work for you if you can learn to harness that in your system. It makes life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, on other things, we're doing things artificially, so we can't expect mother nature to just Be magically perfect. conjure up carbon for us. Mm -hmm. and because we have elevated levels of nitrates and phosphates than you would you know, in, in the mass vastness of the ocean, um you have to you have to artificially you know add the carbon to get that magical rep for the ratio uh in place yep now if you don't want a carbon dose i mean something more than more natural methods is you know having a large refugium that grows enough chato or calerpa or whatever type of algae to take up these nutrients is more of the natural way mm -hmm. right so car yeah. carbon dosing is an alternative maybe you don't have space for a refugium so there's a couple of different reasons why you might want to do it over refugium, but most of the time it's because either you have a small refugium but can't keep up to how much you feed, or it could just be that, you know, maybe you have a smaller tank, you don't have the space for refugium. There's a number of reasons like that that could kind of play into it. Uh, sorry, <coughs> Dev. Ross is just saying that uh, carbon is in abundance in the reef tank. No. It's, sorry, Ross. It, it's the opposite. Yeah. Carbon isn't in abundance in the reef tank what is in abundance in the reef tank is your nitrate and phosphate because we're adding it constantly or allowing it to develop constantly so because carbon as a carbon source isn't in abundance mm -hmm. in the system that's why it, it the, the formula is is lopsided and that's why you can you, you know to to get that ratio correctly if that's the method you want to use we'd have to add the carbon to it yeah yeah so the sorry if i didn't say that clearly no, yeah, so the Redfield Ratio, um, they revamped it a little bit. I just actually, where was it? Anyways, it, it's around 115 or so carbon to 16 nitrate to 1 phosphorus, phosphate. So it's kind of, and carbon is by far the most limited nutrient in the tank. So if you, um, 
so usually that's that's why carbon dosing is kind of the main thing right because that is the one that's going to run out the most it's not abundant every time you feed your tank you got phosphates and nitrates in the food you're feeding so that's why they're generally plentiful in the tank um, if you dose carbon to get the ratio correct you absolutely need a protein skimmer you should have one because the protein skimmer is going to bind a lot of these older bacteria or stuff that's absorbed the nitrates and it will work its way into your skimmer cup. So it's kind of a one way of exporting it. So I would, if you're going to do carbon dosing, I'd, yeah, I highly recommend you go with the skimmer. Mm. So for that cleared it up. Automated nitrate testing. That would be nice. I don't know if there is any automated nitrate test. It's more of a trickier test at least i know my test kit takes about 10 minutes to do so i don't do it as often but the nitrate the if you wanted something like a monitor mm -hmm. that's like well i mean i don't know because we said that about kh before right and, and here it is you've got that yeah so but if you could get a monitor for nitrate that'd be like again another holy grail of bits of kit yep if you guys haven't checked out like the cage like uh alcatronic mm -hmm. who's one that got involved with that that piece of kit wow amazing you know i um, i've been watching and tempted on that one for a while i'll tell you what they've um the uk distributor put them in touch with the supplier to get help them with the distribution of it and mm -hmm. they were a little bit standoffish at first yeah because they hadn't looked at it and then they've been testing the unit uh, from Eric for about a month mm -hmm. and um, I got a phone call and there was he just said to me like wow Nick like, I'm so glad you pushed us into it because we've had this piece of kit running a month yeah. and it's not nudged the slightest bit it's rock solid that's the electronic one you're talking that, about or? yeah the electronic yeah, yeah. it, it does look pretty nice that distributor is also the distributor of Triton as well which is why I wanted mm -hmm. to have it because it goes hand in hand with Triton right yes yeah. um and yeah, the Vince was saying to me, like, we've had this unit on test for like a month and it, it, it's like rock solid. And he was nice. saying that you can just tell the development, the, the design and everything about the product has just been really, really well thought out, which I think is so important, you know, because I've seen it before where new products come out and then they're out for a while and then all of a sudden everyone's having problems with them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think they did uh, a lot of due diligence with uh, with the Apertronics. It's been a really nice piece of kit. I mean, that, to say, you know, like Vince was saying, like, their KH was rock solid yep. for, like, over a month. That's, you can't get better than that. One thing, just, I know we're kind of sidebarred for a, a moment sure. here, but one thing on that, I watched, I was, I'm following a big thread on Reef to Reef, just kind of keeping an eye on it, because I've been debating one of those for a while. Mm. And even one thing, like, so a bunch of people are complaining about the pump noise. And, you know, within a month or so, I think they had an upgrade pump kit. And they gave it free to all the users yeah. that had the Gen 1. So that, that was pretty right. cool to see that for support. So it's nice to see that they're yeah. standing behind it. Yeah, all. I saw that. I saw that release. I haven't got one myself yet. But mm -hmm. um, I sort of saw it. But I didn't yeah. know whether, what, whether it was just better pumps or what it was. So that was due to, like, a bit of elevated noise on the system. or mm -hmm. Right. So did they change them up to like step the pumps or something like that maybe i don't know maybe i don't know what they changed to the pumps but i saw the new ones were you know almost silent and they're right. I, I was just really happy to see that they gave them for free like it's on the website yeah. like one dollar or something just to order it to everyone that had the gen ones so that was cool oh, to wow. see. it made me happy to see that yeah um, no i think it's um i mean that's the thing you just don't know maybe we will see a nitrate monitor at some point you know yep yeah it could be um so dano you're just asking about the adding vinegar to your calc so yes you are that one did come up earlier but that is essentially you are carbon dosing without even knowing it uh aloha <laughs> aloha reef uh it's anaerobic bacteria right i made a nitrate reactor in the past that had very low flow to promote anaerobic bacteria with carbon dosing they work well as long yes. as you're consistent nice yeah they want like as well, what you can do, because there's, like I said, there's various forms and bacteria strains that you can get in your system. Mm -hmm. So one way to kind of promote the kind of strains that you want is you can seed, you know, using uh, products like Dr. Tim's mm -hmm. uh, or um, Fritz or ATM. So you can actually buy a bottled bacteria seed, you know, with that 
and uh, then when you feed in your carbon you feed in those bacteria, right yep no that's a good point then you're adding exactly the strains you're after so there is many exactly. different strains and each one will absorb or eat or however it does with different different types of sources of you know that molecule in your tank so by adding mm. just the ones you want so earlier someone mentioned the video by red sea one of their scientists on nopox and that right. was one of their big things is eventually if you're dosing the carbons sources via vodka or vinegar and all this eventually you're going to have a buildup of all these stuffs in your tank that you may not want where in their mm. formula they try to keep it just only stuff that targets the good bacteria strains so that is a potential thing right if you do water mm. changes and stuff maybe it's not an issue i know a lot of people that do do the carbon dosing it's because they're trying to get away from water changes so that could be a potential risk long term if you're using your own solution versus one that's manufactured or whatever to only target those strains so something to consider i mean that's why for me personally i'm a big believer in workload appropriate how can i put it appropriate workload so mm -hmm. for example the way i set the systems up i'm not reliant on the skimmer to do 90 percent of the work for example mm -hmm. um and the same with the bio pellets and things like that if the bio if i took the bio pellet reactor offline my nitrates wouldn't go suddenly go through the roof in a week because it's not doing 90 percent of the reduction other things that you put in place like even down to escaping um how you feed the type of fish you have um the the flow system you know even things like using miracle mud mm -hmm. you know things like that or like you were saying earlier Dev, about um you know refugium you know filter floss and filter stock holders you know all those things all play a part yeah uh with your nitrates mm -hmm. right so what i would say is is when you're looking at vodka dosing or using bio pellets and reactors and things like that always think of that as the last piece of kit that polishes things off mm -hmm. for you if you put everything else in place first then the job that you're asking it to do isn't a massive job it's just going to take you like the rest of the way if you like so it, for me i, I wouldn't say <clears throat> rely on vodka dosing carbon mm -hmm. dosing and pearls and pellets as your reduction method in, it, a, in its entirety yeah more of a last resort. everything else <clears throat> nope. not last resort so much but like down the you chain. can do everything else mm -hmm. you can do and then you put in less emphasis on that you know mm -hmm. less reliant re uh, what's the word uh reliance reliance yeah, that's, yeah. All right. that's the one there so less re reliance on that mm -hmm. then you're not going to be at risk of overdosing and stuff because you're not going to need to do a lot no, that's a great point. And it is one of those steps down the chain. I mean, filter floss, take it all the time. Filter socks, change them every couple of days, not every week. Like all that stuff mm. is going to remove those nutrients before they break down into nitrates in your system. So it's more being well, prevented. A, that's an interesting one with the filter socks and the filter mm -hmm. floss as well, because I see a lot of people just using socks on their own. Yeah, I'm always a big believer of putting floss in the sock. So the sock becomes a filter floss holder. Basically. Because it's a lot easier to, to, sorry, take out, rinse, or throw away mm -hmm. your floss than it is to wash your sock. Yeah. So what a lot of people do is they leave the sock in until it's overflowing. <laughs> I do. I, that's what I do in my big tank. In my nano, I put a little chunk of like the polyfill, whatever stuff on, and I can just chuck that out every five, six days. But the flo the sock, yeah, it's generally like, oh, it's overflowing. I should probably change that. So it's not really doing much to remove nutrients at all. Well, the thing is, it depends because it. On your system, you know, mm -hmm. you could probably get away with that because, you know, your corals are just going to feed on the excess. Mm -hmm. uh, if the system isn't as mature or, or quite as well balanced, then if you, I always say, like, imagine you go to make a cup of tea. I know it's a very British thing, but cup you go to make a cup of tea yeah. <laughs> and you've got your tea bag, right? So yeah. if you imagine the tea bag is your sock and the tea leaves is all your waste. You put the tea bag in the cup and then you pour the water in. What happens? The water goes brown, right? Because mm -hmm. the tea leaves are leaching out. And that's the same with a filter sock. You know, the, when the water's piling through it as it builds up, it's not capturing everything. Yeah. As the water's hammering through, it's pushing stuff out of it. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'd say use sort of floss inside. And then, like you said, if it discolors over a day, two days, change it. Because yeah. what you're doing is then is you're completely removing 
you know, what's leaching out. You completely take it out of your system, you export it, it straight away out. So mm -hmm. there's no chance of it leaching, continues to leach into your system. Yeah. Whereas if you leave it to build up and build up, while it's building up, it's continuously leaching at the same time. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. No, great points. Um, I am still really curious too to try the the whole filter rollers because that will resolve me being too lazy to change the socks frequently enough. So it'll be interesting <laughs> how that relates. And then my other thing I'm actually trying is a uh, LG Church Scrubber. So once that's been running for a while, that'll probably be a future video once it breaks in and see how it actually does. So on that point, I actually have to test my phosphate and nitrates beforehand since I just installed it <laughs> and kind of see how it does. I pur purposely left my Chato reactor. I haven't plugged it in in weeks just to try and let my nutrients build up a bit. Cause I'm curious if then I can see more of the impact of it. Sorry, what was that? No fewer. Um, do, do, do. Oh, I purposely haven't used my Chato reactor in a few weeks now. Oh, okay. To see what happens. Well, I purposely want to let it build up a bit and then partially cause mm -hmm. I'm putting a, a turf scrubber on the other day. So I'm kind of mm. want to see how that kind of compares. So purposely just trying to let it build up a bit and then see what happens. Yeah. Are you comparing the difference between the turf algae and the Cheeto? Trying to, to. Yeah, trying to to an extent. So, I mean. I mean, turf algae is very efficient. It's very prolific. Yep. So that's why, you know, that came about. That's always so, been my theory. But it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what happens on my tank. Like for one instance, I mean, straight up, like phosphates have never been a big issue. Nitrate's always yeah. been in the 15 to 30 range, so I'm kind of curious, too, how far it will take them down. And, you know, do I just feed more or run it less? We'll see. But, but what about if you compare an algae scrubber with a mature refugium that has millions of antipods in there? Millions. Then that'll give you a different result, right? Yep. <laughs> That's what I used to have when I went to a Chato reactor, so. <laughs> uh, I think there's benefit in both. They all, they, um, they all have benefits. I mean, honestly, part of it is I've done, I've had Clerpa, I've had Chato, I've done a big refugium, I've done the LG reactor. It's the only one I haven't tried. So I feel like I have to try the full spectrum so I can fully speak to it all. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good way to do it. I think you do well, Deb, with the way that you tried lots of different things mm -hmm. and then, you know, research it, put it on, see the difference it makes and then like, understand it. The big it's thing... A, yeah, the big thing right. too is using it for an extended period, right? Like I had my chain reactor for like mm. six, seven months now, and then I obviously it's been doing a great job. So I'd be curious to see how this is next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, always like for me though, just kind of like a word of advice when you do comparisons and stuff like yeah. that, make sure you're doing an entire comparison mm -hmm. rather than say, oh, well, I took this off and I put that on. Yeah. But then it's like, yeah, but did you do everything else that that needed to work? You know, mm -hmm. and how did you analyze it? Did you analyze it a week after it went on? Or did you let it bed in mature to the stage where it become prolific and efficient? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, took you. Oh, exactly. Results. Yeah. Like there's, it'll be probably a few weeks, a month at least before I, of letting it run before mm -hmm. I even do anything with it. Yeah. It's a weird one for me because um, one of the best tanks I ever had, I did like pretty much 100% water changes on it. Yeah. And had no filtration or anything which kind of goes against the grain of what we're talking about, really, when we say use Mother Nature and try and get all these systems in place to get mm -hmm. an ecosystem built up, where that one it was like a totally artificial well, it seems... system where it was almost like a rock pool yep. that, you know, a big wave came and crashed in and threw out all the old water and put all the new water in, and that was it. Well, <laughs> hey, that honestly, if you can do that, if you live right beside an ocean, have a nice clean source of water, now, it, it seems to me like the big trend these days is to not do water changes, whether it's just because you want to spend that, pay for that bucket of salt every month or a couple months or whatnot it is. You spend all these money on all these other things so that you don't have to do buy salt and do water changes. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, it does seem like that's what I, you know, everyone's kind of goal on the side is to reduce water changes, whether it's save money on salt or just because they don't want to walk over and do that maintenance. I don't know. But it does seem like that is kind of what a lot of the push is for these days. Yeah, it's, um, I think if, if you, like I said before, if you can embrace more of the nature in your reefing and get to understand 
how to harness that you learn so much i think it's mm -hmm. like the interaction and the different layers you know of the ecosystem what a system needs to to do well mm -hmm. that that's where i think you really kind of get that and then rather than you know if it, I mean, there's different ways to reef, and I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing anyone's particular methods, because if you've got healthy fish and coral, then, you know, you're doing something right. And there is different ways of achieving that. Mm -hmm. But if you solely rely on water changes because you can't instill another method, my advice would be to learn to instill different ways and methods, and then you get a very comprehensive overview of what you're doing and you can you know pull a bit of this and pick a bit of that and make your own concoction of a system that yeah. way you know and i think you different coral species different fish as well benefit from that i i don't treat like all my fish the same way or all the corals the same way i target feed certain fish and don't others um you know so it, I, you know it's a very complicated thing that we're trying to set up so I think you need to be very comprehensive about, you know, understanding how to look after it. Mm -hmm. Just a quick kind of thing in the comments. So Jimmy was saying, so he has 0 0.02 phosphate, zero nitrate. Any tips? He does have a refugium. Um, yeah, the and a eight inch deep sand bed. The big, I mean, the biggest thing you adding your phosphate nitrates to the tank is all almost like 95% comes from what your food and what you're adding to feed your fish. So feeding your fish more, more frequently or more is the easiest way to do it. Um, they'll be happier if they get multiple feedings per day or if they get more food. So yeah, I just up your feeding slowly. That'd be the, one of the biggest things I'd do. Reef dad, love your channel. You helped lots. Thank you very much for the kind comments. <laughs> so everyone loves feeding the fish. I hate feeding my fish. Really? And they just expect it all the time. Yeah, honestly, uh, people think I'm cool because I don't feed my fish. But if you see my fish, they're all fat and healthy. You know, because there's enough food in the system for them to find and eat and, you know, uh, forage and stuff. Yeah. And are it's your rocks like... covered in algae? Or are they eating all your pots? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not actually. Um, they're, they're really clean because I'm purging the system. Yeah. Uh, ready to put my corals in, so they're all cleaned up. I'm just but, um, <laughs> Yeah, no. But it's yeah. like, yeah, my fox face is like massive now. I got one who's like it's the size of my thumb. Mm -hmm. And now it's huge and big and fat, but he doesn't get fed a lot at all. Like once every four or five days. And mm -hmm. I see people like feeding their fish like two or three times a day, like chunks and chunks of food. Um, but the system runs really clean because I'm not putting any food in. And mm -hmm. they're almost like recycling everything. Um, but I, I must admit, though, like I haven't got fish like Antheus, for example, that you do need to feed, yeah. you know, like multiple times a day because it's the way they eat. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying everybody just don't feed your fish for four five days. <laughs> yeah, you know, it depends just, on what fish you have. Yeah, just on know. that note, Antheus have a really mm -hmm. tiny stomach, so they basically need to constantly eat. Yeah. So if you have them, I mean, if you have a job away from home, like you definitely want an auto feeder, and you know, maybe have, give them three helpings a day every four hours type of thing. Like they need that constant thing of food going on. But well, that's another thing, like when I'm saying about embracing Mother Nature, because if you if you set up a system, then just go to the store and say, "Oh, I like that fish. I like that fish. I like that fish. I like that fish. Oh, I want some coral now. I love that coral. That coral. That coral." Mm -hmm. Then you kind of you can make it hard for yourself. Yeah. If you, for example, want to keep SPS dominated reef tank, then what you can do to help yourself is pick fish that will um, help you. Mm -hmm. uh, create a good sort of chemistry in your water and stuff like that. Yeah. So that you're not putting a lot of bioload into your system because of the type of fish mm -hmm. that you put in with the coral. You know, so if your main thing is you want in really nice SPS, then it holds you in good stead to look at the fish that you're going to partner up with that SPS that it doesn't hinder you keeping the SPS by, you know, having to feed it loads of meaty foods that's then going to add a lot of bioloads um just one quick thing for schools way um aloha reef had a good point too with jimmy's asking about trying to up his nitrates um feeding more is kind of the first thing but if that still isn't helping then aloha reef was also suggesting reducing your light schedule or intensity on refugium which is also another way to do it so your less algae growth is gonna be less absorption of those nutrients 
Yeah, exactly. It's weird because um, one of the local stores to me, they rang me up asking me, like, they were in the same situation. Yep. And I said, oh, so you, you, your algae's doing really well then. They're saying, oh, yeah, that's growing great. I said, well, get rid of half of it then. You know, because it's, it's doing too good a job, right? Yeah. And they had the, the biohome filter media in. I said, well, take half of that out as well. Uh, and they go, yeah, but it's doing a really good job. Yeah, it's too good. Mm-hmm. So you can either add more or take less out. So for me, I I take less out rather than add more because when you add more food, you add in more of a lot of other things as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you simply take in less nitrate out, what are you doing? Well, I'm just taking less nitrate out. I'm yep. not putting loads of stuff into my tank that I might not want. It. No. So um, yeah, you you if you're at a point where your filtration system's too too efficient, then just tune it down a little bit. Yep. You harvest some algae out of there mm-hmm. that's that's kind of partial plan for my overkill algae scrubber too if it happens to be too too efficient but we'll see that or if i have to clean it too often i'm just going to reduce the photo period well you can just use a smaller gauze inside so there's less growing mm-hmm. you yeah. know one or the other you know whichever way no, very true uh, there's a few ways you can control an algae scrubber you can turn down the flow to it as well is another way so there's less nutrients get into it per hour yep so there's a i think there's probably about three or four different ways you can tune your your algae score less photo period is probably the easiest yeah yeah for sure yep um jimmy was saying kessel h380 yeah that explains it you have a pretty intense light that's a 90 watt led uh you can only reduce the time you can't change the light power yeah the only way to tune down the light power be raising it higher above it yeah. Or, or if you had some kind of like a filter in front of it, like um, like a diffuser material, like a little vinyl diffuser, you could pop something like that on front of it to cut it down. Yeah, you're yeah. for madness. So a cu- couple kind of different ways to tone it down, but those are kind of your couple options with that. I do wish they had a dimmer on that. They did release a newer version of the light, like H160 or something like that, I think it is, that does have a dimmer, but it's only 30 watts. It'd be nice if they had a 90 mm-hmm. version that you could tone down. Oh well. So yeah, if you guys have, if you guys learned something, you know, hit that thumbs up button. If there's any last comments, probably going to shut her down pretty soon. So if there's anything that we missed or any other questions that you guys have, make sure you drop them in the comments. So out of all your nutrient exportation methods, Nick, what's your favorite? Ooh, I don't, I don't know really. Yeah. I don't know. It's like I use a combination of things, you see. So, mm-hmm. and I've, I've always done that. Um, special blend. Yeah, special blend. No, I've always done that. Um, I think my favorite one I've ever set up, which is really freaky, is the sulfur chip nitrate reactor. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I, I've seen them. I've never used one, though. Did it work well? Yeah, they're really cool. Yeah, they're really cool, like calibrating that. And then just knowing that that's going to just blitz your nitrate. It's brilliant. So I'd say that's probably the most interesting way that I've controlled it before. And then we've got like a special media as well. Because when you run the water through the, the, the sulfur chips, it sucks the uh, pH out. So then we have this special media, which is top secret, which is um, a pH stabilizing media. Mm-hmm. So it'll stabilize the pH at 8.3. Yeah. So when the water goes in, it's whatever it is. When it comes out, it's 8.3. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Nice. There you go. <laughs> Shall I send you one, Dev? You want to play with one? I'll send you one. My buddy has, it's like giant, this giant big blue metal cylinder type of thing that he has. And I don't think he hooked it, it up. It? I don't know where he got it. I think someone's given away and he got it. So I'm curious right. to see. I guess all you can do is control the flow through it to adjust it. But yeah. Yeah, they're brilliant. It's a weird thing as well. Like just to know that the water goes in dirty, comes out clean. It's like an RO. It's like an RO filter for your tank. So does it yeah, have a life? Is there a point where you're like it's exhausted all the sulfur inside of it and how's that work? Uh or does I've it just only work ever forever? Set up on like a light, light system, so yeah, I didn't really I think I changed that after about maybe a year and a half or something like that. Okay. So it's good. it's only a small system. I haven't done it on a big system because the pods are only small. So I haven't done a full like 
like a Deltec or something like that. They used to do really big nitro reactors. I haven't done any of those. Well, yeah, it's just the freaking to just think of this water. It's like an RO, you know, mm-hmm. goes into it, comes out clean. It's brilliant. <laughs> so it's so simple. It's done. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Easy it's like to get to. Eh? It's like a magic. Well, you'd have to be careful with it, you know. Um, I can't let it foul and stuff like that. So you have to watch them. But uh, yeah, it's just weird. It's just weird to know that it just goes in dirty, comes out clean. It's just weird. Uh, yeah, that's simple. awesome. Uh, good stuff. Well, I think we got all the comments. We're at about an hour. It's summertime. I'm probably going to do keep it around an hour point for the summer just because there's, you know, more people are doing stuff and life's always mm-hmm. crazy. What are you doing for next week? Therefore, what's your subject for next week? I don't know. Oh, one well, yet? Yeah. Most of the time, it's based off whatever people send me for questions on stuff. Is there anything common that usually turns to live stream? If you guys mm-hmm. have something you want me to do live stream on, once the video is over, Throw those requests in the comments of this I video. We need to do a, I think we need to do a live stream on... Uh, what was that um, new controller that you just reviewed? The a Coral one? E-Coral, I think it's E-Coral. called? E-Coral. We need to do an E-Coral versus <laughs> Apex live stream. There has been some interesting comments in that video. No um, way. Way. So I am going Terrence to do... Is Terrence being a... defensive or... <laughs> you can go judge for yourself. I'm just asking. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to do a controller live stream at some point in the next few weeks. <laughs> so that's going to come. I still want to find you're gonna some. T- you're going to title it the best aquatic controller <laughs> ever, ever, ever in the history of aquatic. No, nope, just aquarium controllers. <laughs> uh, but there's all these ones like the aquatic, whatever, whatever. There's like four or five different controllers or more. There's a ton of controllers. I've only used a couple, so I want to find people that have or have used a bunch of the other brands. So it'll be kind of an interesting chat comparison about them all. So basically in a few weeks, once I find a bunch of people like the Reef Keepers and all the different ones. So if you guys have done it, you guys used or have all these different brands, you know, hit me up and let me know. Because eventually I want to do a cool kind of combination one on it and go from there. I want to find out if that one, are they going to make K version of that product? I told them they would be very wise too. We'll see if they listen. Yeah. The Apex distributors are really a pain in the ass. Yeah, I hear so that. So it'd be nice to see a, yeah, it'd be nice to see a, to see a better product over here. Yep. That we can use. Um so yeah, hopefully I mean it's a smart move if they do do that because I know that's lacking a lot of the European market. Mm. I noticed on that controller as well, Dave, you made a comment about the you didn't have the functionality where you could program it so much but that you hadn't needed to because what it came with worked really well yeah so i can't do custom coding right i can't go in there and right. do my own custom you got to pick what what is your source what do you want it to trigger like it's all is it's very easy mm. but there was no you couldn't get crazy in depth custom but then again i haven't had that scenario to try that that i could come up with yet right but on the Did flip side my nano's not that is, with the apex sir? pardon did you find that you wanted to do that with the Apex? I like did. Pro- right. <laughs> but I, it's also my Nano versus my Big Tank, and I do more complicated stuff on the Big Tank. So I don't know. Ah, I got to okay. try and come up with some more situations for it. Um, that mm-hmm. video was kind of, here's my unboxing. Here's me after three and a half weeks. I wanted to wait a few weeks of using it so I could play with it to get a good feel for it. Yeah. So that's kind of my overview. I somehow knew this would come up during this live stream. I was curious um. to get out. <laughs> But, um, you're on about the Alcatronic as well. Is that a product that you'd be interested in trialing out and running? I've been thinking about it. Yeah, let me speak to Eric and see if we can make that happen for you. Mm-hmm. I can't promise that you'll be able to keep it, but <laughs> I think yeah. you, you could maybe send you one to run and then you might be able to purchase it kind of thing. But mm-hmm. I can have a word of him about that. Yeah. Well, so. yeah, that'd be an interesting one because that's like the new... I can't believe we could, more people aren't talking about it because it's like the... the it's like the new wave of technology, that stuff, you know, cage controllers. Yeah, no, I'll probably end up with it eventually. I've kind of been back and forth on what to go for, what to do with it, but that and they're not the cheapest. But... as well, right? I the know, there's Senai lots coming up. As well. So that's going to be awesome. So everything's cage, cage, cage at the moment. Yep, elk, elk monitor slash controller, the new trend mm. in the hobby lately. Yeah, no, that's good. No interesting stuff. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with it all. Be interesting. Fun toys, always. So, as mentioned earlier, guys, if you enjoyed it or you learned something, hit that thumbs up button. Um, otherwise, 
If you got any suggestions or stuff that you want me to do a future live stream on, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, it's usually a couple days beforehand. It's usually based off my Ask Reef Dudes. If I get common questions, usually that's what feels live streams, live stream topics. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and I will catch you guys on Monday's video or next week's live stream. Thanks, guys. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.